Hello everyone, Assalamu Alaikum. I am Dr. Muhammad Ali and today we are here with online lecture 2 which is uh, scheduled because of the coronavirus thing. We are doing distance learning now so we are continuing our face to face lecture series of the PhD course seminars in advanced human resource economics. Uh, this is a course uh, based in uh, School of Social Sciences and Humanities NUST. This was supposed to be lecture 10 in the regular course but uh, this is a, a second of the online series so this is why you might see the uh, confusing headline uh, heading over uh, over this slide so online this is a second online lecture but um, in continuity this is our lecture 10 and today we will be talking about uh, technology and labor market in the previous lecture we covered um, innovation we covered um, agent based model and we discussed how innovation is dependent on uh, type of knowledge, tacit knowledge, codified knowledge. Um, then we also discussed the role of absorptive capacity in there. Um, today lecture is still on technology but it's more on the role of um, automation and artificial intelligence and how it affects the uh, labor market outcomes, how it affects the um, employability, how it affects the job availability in the market and stuff like that. I will present some statistics. I will also present some of the, I'll give examples through some YouTube videos uh, to give you an idea how technology is progressing and how we can expect uh, things to change in the labor market. This is not particular to developed countries, but uh, as I'll show using the real time data, that uh, this is also true for developed and developing countries. So this is happening in both. So we are, I'm sitting in Pakistan now, and Nest is in Pakistan. So I'll give some examples from Pakistan as well. And some of these statistics are also showing that polarization is also happening in Pakistan. So what is polarization? and um, uh, details about that using statistics and um, concepts as well, we'll uh, see later on in, in this lecture, okay? So let's uh, move forward. As I said, this lecture is about skills and technology, how technological change affects labor market, skill bias, technological change, and wage inequality. Don't be scared by this term, skill bias technological change as we grow go through this lecture slowly slowly you'll understand these terminologies and uh, it, it's a very easy to understand concept primarily because we have been talking about this for a long long time now how technology and how artificial intelligence might take over our jobs and we have been hearing so many things about that so it's just a fancy name um, of saying that uh, technological change is biased towards some skills and um, it gives rise to some skills and it's against some skills. So uh, you'll understand it as we go along. Um, today, in, these are the two readings that are recommended for this lecture. The second reading here is assigned to one of the PhD students and she will do a presentation on it. Uh, that will be for next week. Today in this lecture I am planning to uh, give an introduction and uh, uh, I'm, I think I will not reach the point where I will discuss um, Otter and Dawn 2013, the one that is mentioned here, the first one in the reading list. But this, is, this will be covered in this uh, topic. So um, idea is that next week one of our students will cover the second paper and once she's, once she's done with that, I will continue uh, with, the, uh, with the first paper. So this will, be, uh, this will conclude our um, chapter on our, our, our class on skills and technology, the role of skills and technology in the uh, labor markets. So I want to show you some videos. How does artificial intelligence, um, how is artificial intelligence uh, progressing? So we do have some ideas, but I found this video very fascinating. So let's watch uh, some bits of it and um, I will uh, try to explain 
some of the aspects of this video as well as we go along. Now this robot needs to learn how to walk, but the, ch the challenge is, the catch is that it does not know what it looks like, right? So it does not know, you look at this robot, you can see it has four legs, but the robot does, has no clue what it looks like. Doesn't know if it's a snake, if it's a spider, if it's a tree, has no clue how these eight motors and uh, legs are arranged. Doesn't even know about legs. So what does it do? So, so imagine yourself sitting in a black box, no windows, no nothing, just a black box, and all you have are eight knobs. And as you turn the eight knobs, these knobs are connected somehow to motors, and as you turn these knobs, you can feel the box tilting left and right, forward and backwards, but you don't know how the motors are connected and what's the morphology of the machine. This is what this robot feels. So uh, this robot needs to learn how to walk. So how does it walk? It can do random trial and error. It can move. You know, if you're in this box, you could move the, the, the knobs, you can turn the knobs and kind of guess your way to make this robot move forward. But an alternative is to do a kind of this systematic exploration. So how does this robot work? It begins by making a random motion, randomly moving the motors. Okay, this is kind of the, the thing that Rolf uh, mentioned, this kind of, uh, what did you call it? Motor babbling. So it begins by babbling, just moving the motors in a random way. And then it sends, collects all the sensory information, and then it forms hypotheses about what it might be. And what you can see at the top left are all the hypotheses, different shapes, different self images that it came up with that explain what it might be. All right, so let's see what, it, uh, what happens. So this is one of our first runs when we, when you have a robot uh, running, uh, you never know if it's the last time it works, so you always have the camera running. This is uh, uh, one of the first times we turn it on, we let it babble and learn about itself. It unplugged itself, that's too bad. <laughs> and uh, so, so, you know, you don't want to let the robot babble too much. Uh, it might, you don't want to walk off a cliff just to see what it feels like, right? So, so we, we tame the robot a little bit um, and, uh, and let's see what happens. This is work uh, led by Josh Mongard, uh, who was a uh, uh, Rolf Pfeiffer student uh, before he came to my lab. So you can see the thread running uh, through. And here's the robot doing, uh, forming hypotheses about what it is. You can see it's all, they're all wrong hypotheses, but they all make the cube tilt in the same way. So as far as the robot knows, these are all valid hypotheses. This is the eighth out of 16 trials. It's beginning to realize that it has four limbs, but doesn't quite know how they're connected and where they're connected and so forth. And this is the 16th out of 16 interaction with the world, and it's pretty much figured that it has four limbs. The actual positions are a little bit inaccurate, but it's good enough that it can figure out uh, a way to, uh, to walk. Here's, uh, here's the robot uh, uh, figuring out a way of moving. I don't know if we can call it walking, but, uh, it, uh, and here it is actually uh, moving in reality. So we were hoping for a evil spidery walk, but instead, we got this lame way of moving forward. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea, right? So it started with nothing, and it learned how it learned that it has four limbs. Then it learned how to use those four limbs to move forward. So this is one of the examples of where artificial intelligence is heading, um, and uh, so many applications. You can you can think about many applications. And uh, there are there are many things that uh, this will this thing will do. Another video is of a self-driving car. Um, it is not this video is not as long, uh, and uh, I think most of you have seen uh, this um, seen this already in movies and stuff. So I think it will be very uh, self-explanatory. and looking at the traffic lights, lights and uh, things like that. The video quality is not that good right now. I hope that it will readjust in a minute because you'll see that it can all, also see the traffic lights stop and then uh, move, um, move uh, right next to the cliff as well. So uh, very, very interesting.
So you can see on the right how this car is looking at different cars, judging where uh, where the um, other cars are coming from, so making movements according, accordingly and um, quite interesting. How does this help? Uh, robot learning to walk, um, we saw that it was quite interesting. Um, there can be various different applications of that, uh, but self-driving cars, we already know how beneficial they could be. So on average, 1.3 million people die in car accidents around the world, twice as more as war, crime and terrorism put together. So when AI powered cars increase on the road, in general, they'll understand each other and they'll not drive too fast. They'll not ignore lights or stop signs and they'll be much smarter and they'll follow rules. Uh, machines are very good at follow, following rules and uh, so self-driving cars are the future. Um, later on we'll see when we'll talk about disruptions and we'll talk about how AI might be taking our, our jobs but why we may not have to fear if we do certain things. My theory is that um, uh, I'm not an expert in all this, but my, my theory is that uh, technology is changing and has been changing the shape of labor market since the beginning. But did we see people dying because of unemployment, because of technology? No, because people tend to adopt. People learn different skills and then because technology changes the way we do things. People who get um, get unemployed because of the introduction of technology, they learn new skills, maybe in the same field or maybe in other fields, and then they find jobs. So um, in terms of um, innovation economics, this is what we call creative destruction, where we are destroying something, but we are creating uh, something as well. We'll talk about that later on. So we uh, talked about a robot that is learning to walk based on its own intelligence. Then we, we saw a car that was intelligent enough to uh, drive itself in a real time environment. And um, so one of the cons of this self driving car is that um, it could be hackable. So you might have seen this movie uh, Fast and Furious 6. By the way, I'm going to give some uh, references of movies in this lecture because recently, because of the advancements in technology, many movies have seen have shown uh, this kind of technology, uh, technological advancements. Um, it was there a long time ago in James Bond movies as well. But um, if you have seen Fast and Furious 6, you may have seen the, this one scene where uh, they hack the um, electric cars. Uh, they install something, and the cars are um, the cars lose control, and they are controlled by some bad guys. So um, that is one of the cons, and millions of jobs of the drivers will will get obsolete. Uh, uh, many people say uh, in Pakistan, for example, a developing country like Pakistan, that uh, self-driving cars are a threat to Uber drivers and um, taxi drivers. My conjecture here is that um, uh, self-driving cars are taking away jobs of taxi drivers in developed countries because labor is expensive there. Labor is not expensive here. So uh, I think things like self-driving cars um, are, I think, a luxury. So electric cars, I'm all for them. Uh, self-driving cars, I'm not saying that we should stop them. But um, why do I need a self-driving car in Pakistan? That's, that's um, something that we can uh, think about. So in healthcare, two more short videos. One is about retina scan. Let's see uh, this video very quickly. AI is going to impact many, many fields. And I want to give you a couple of examples today. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. Last year, we announced our work on diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness, and we use deep learning to help doctors diagnose it earlier. And we've been running field trials since then at Aravind and Sankara hospitals in India, and the field trials are going really well. 
we are bringing expert diagnosis to places where trained doctors are scarce. It turned out, using the same retinal scans, there were things which humans quite didn't know to look for, but our AI systems offered more insights. Your same eye scan turns out holds information with which we can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack or strokes. So to me, the interesting thing is that you know, more than what doctors could find in these eye scans, the machine learning systems offered newer insights. This could be the basis for a new non-invasive way to detect uh, cardiovascular risk. And we are working. We just published the research, and we are going to be working to bring this to field trials with our partners. Another area where AI can help is to actually help doctors predict medical events. Turns out doctors have a lot of difficult decisions to make. And for them, getting advance notice, say 24 to 48 hours before a patient is likely to get very sick, has a tremendous difference in the outcome. And so we put our machine learning systems to work. We've been working with our partners using de-identified medical records. And it turns out if you go and analyze over 100,000 data points per patient, more than any single doctor could analyze, we can actually quantitatively predict the chance of readmission 24 to 48 hours before, earlier than traditional methods. It gives doctors more time to act. So as you saw, retina scan uh, is changing many things in health, healthcare systems around the world. Uh, many of these aspects are being tested right now and um, in our lifetime we'll see the mass implication of that in our daily lives as well. Similar kind of concept is IBM Watson. Let's look at that as well. The world's approach to health is broken, but that's about to change. Medical data doubles every three years and the $7 trillion health industry is unable to keep up with the staggering rate at which information is produced. From medical records, clinical trials, and research, to personal fitness bands, implanted devices, and other sensors that collect real-time data, each of us can generate the equivalent of 300 million books of health-related data in our lifetime. In fact, approximately 35 cents of every dollar spent on medical care is wasted. And yet, there is a reason for hospitals, doctors, insurers, and patients alike to be optimistic about the future. The reason is Watson Health Cloud. The IBM Watson Health Cloud brings together vast amounts of medical data into one centralized thinking hub on the cloud, combining traditional analytics with the advanced cognitive capabilities of Watson, the ability to learn and over time refine its analysis based on what it is learning, to turn this wealth of data into knowledge. Take Raul. Raul has a family, a busy job, and an active lifestyle. He also has a heart condition. It's mild, but it could worsen over time. He works closely with his doctor to monitor the problem, but they have difficulty finding medication that doesn't limit his busy lifestyle. And with the mountain of medical data available, it's nearly impossible to keep up with the latest treatments. Raul's doctor starts using a new app created from the Watson Health Cloud. It allows him to review Raul's personal and family medical history from other doctors, even insurance providers, and incorporate that information with data from Raul's Fitbit. This provides both Raul and his doctor with meaningful insights about his condition over time. Watson Health Cloud operates in an ecosystem environment. As in nature, an ecosystem brings together many contributors to keep the system functioning smoothly. Watson Health Cloud's ecosystem functions much the same way. It combines massive amounts of data and knowledge and brings together researchers, doctors, patients, pharmaceutical companies, and insurers in a secure and open platform. As Raul and his doctor continue to use Watson Health Cloud through the app, the app contributes that data back into the Watson ecosystem. This give and take makes Watson Health Cloud more dynamic, intelligent, and efficient for everyone. The app combines knowledge about Raul's heart condition with data in the Watson Health Cloud from patients with the same condition. Using analytics and insights, the app makes the best recommendations for Raoul's care. When a new study suggests a correlation between an allergy medication Raoul takes and increased risk of heart disease, the app alerts Raoul's doctor and suggests a possible replacement medication. Since the app knows Raoul is an avid runner, 
the app suggests a medication that doesn't interfere with strenuous physical activity. Raul never has to worry about his medical privacy because IBM goes to great lengths to keep knowledge about patients private and anonymous, ensuring that before any of Raul's medical records reach the cloud, they are stripped of any and all personal identifiers. This process refers to de-identification services, which are crucial to creating a safe, secure cloud environment. As the knowledge base continues to grow, apps built using the Watson Health Cloud enable researchers, doctors, and pharmaceutical companies to drive medical advancements and improve patient outcomes. Physicians can be more confident and accountable in their treatments, and individuals like Raul can be more responsible for their own health and wellness by taking preventative action. IBM Watson Health Cloud is rapidly transforming healthcare around the world. Its advanced cognitive capabilities, interactive ecosystem, and secure de-identification dramatically change the dynamic between patients, doctors, and the medical community, creating a brighter, healthier future for all. So as you saw, um, Retina Scan, IBM Watson, all these kind of fancy new technologies are going to change things around us. And imagine that one IBM Watson can, uh, can help many doctors. So uh, will they replace doctors? Uh, this is one of the things that you should think about. Whenever uh, people who claim that uh, AI is going to destroy many jobs in the market, uh, we will see later on that uh, jobs like um, of lawyers and doctors and managers and researchers and teachers may not be completely replaced by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can help them do their jobs better. For example, um, one person, one doctor cannot remember all the types of research papers that he or she has read, everything that he or she memorized to, uh, to give exams in the medical studies, and everything that he or she watched or practiced during her lifetime, his or her lifetime as a doctor. But when you have something like IBM Watson at your disposal, you can simply use the diagnostics of a patient and ask for the recommendation from the system. It doesn't mean the system will uh, pick up the injection and take the medicine and inject it himself, itself the doctor will be guided by the system making him or her more productive than before. So in this way technology is helping uh, those who are in field and making them more efficient. They, they'll make less errors and uh, maybe predict risk of uh, risks of uh, uh, diseases or uh, uh, serious health effects uh, later on in their lives. So it's not uh, very difficult to um, perceive. So we are, most of us are, have used this uh, band that we use on our uh, wrists to monitor our health, uh, to monitor our uh, pulse. Um, some of these um, watches also have blood pressure um, indicator in them. Some of them, uh, most of them uh, measure how many uh, steps you have walked, calculate um, calories and so on, very basic stuff. Combine that, make it more advanced, combine that with, uh, with the cloud-based technology such as IBM Watson, that one person is always connected to IBM Watson and if something happens or if something is about to happen, the uh, doctor will be um, informed about uh, something that is going to happen to his patient. So uh, what kind of, how many lives it can save, how many lives it can improve. Uh, there are uh, many, many different applications of this technology. So these are all the examples of how AI is um, progressing and how it may and will change our lives in the near future. So um, what are the um, other applications of AI? For example, in space where the, some places are extremely hot where humans cannot go. Uh, also in, in firefighting, uh, where humans um, find it difficult to uh, go inside and rescue those who are stuck under in fire, robots, AI-based robots can help. Uh, extremely cold areas also, high pressure areas just such as uh, deep ocean, many robots have been used to um, for research to go deep and find samples and do research in 
instead of men risking their lives in going deeper uh, to do their research. So um, robots, automation is helping uh, in many, many different aspects. Again, two <laughs> recommendations of movies. Um, artificial ba intelligence based romantic movies. Of course, these are hypothetical scenarios, but they show that AI can also build emotions. So having emotions, what does it solve? I don't know. But uh, this is where technology is going. Is it dangerous? Yes, um, it can be. Uh, it can do, AI can do a better job uh, than, uh, than humans in many ways, mostly routinized jobs. Uh, but hacking national systems uh, is the biggest threat. And uh, again, another movie recommendation, The Girl in the Spider's Web. Uh, if you watch this movie, this is about how a national system has been hacked by some bad guys. And this is possible. This can be uh, if, if um, uh, most of the systems um, are governed by technology, then this technology can be hacked. So uh, these are dangers and as I just mentioned, um, uh, AI based automatic weapons that are installed at various uh, dangerous uh, or I should say sensitive sites um, have been reported to uh, malfunction and wrongly target uh, people who were not dangerous and taken many innocent lives. So it can be dangerous as well. Financial implications. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, IBM Watson uh, can create, you can create an infinite number of doctors. Of course, there will be advisors, but uh, real doctors will make decisions, final decisions. Uh, same thing can happen with lawyers, teachers and insurance agents, car salesmen, etc. Car salesmen are, are kind of replaced partially by computers already, but insurance agents, um, uh, teachers, lawyers could also be replaced. There is a um, long debate about whether distance learning or real-time teaching is beneficial as compared to um, computer-based learning, but uh, that debate has been going on for a long, long time, and I, I think it will go on for at least uh, 100 more years. Um, but does all technology take over or take away jobs? Um, we have an example of automated teller machines, ATMs, uh, where research has found that ATMs took away some jobs, yes, but they also created some jobs. And so those who were employed as tellers, those were replaced, those jobs were replaced by automated teller machines, but machine is a one-time investment with some operation, of course, but bank could, could save uh, some of its employees who were capable, the bank transformed their jobs into something more sales oriented and they, uh, banks made use of these extra employees instead of firing them. So they could, they could not hire, let's say four or five um, additional employees to do sales job. But since tellers have been replaced, had been replaced by ATMs, they could replace, um, they could place those uh, employees that were replaced by ATM machines into sales jobs. Think of it in that way. If you can consume more, if you can produce more at lower cost, then you save. When you save, you demand for other products. So demand for other products increase. And when demand for other products increase, you also increase jobs in those sectors. So increased products, some of the jobs have been taken by technology, but it, they, because of the increase in efficiency, it's, they save you money. And with those savings, you can you demand other products and create jobs in those sectors. So it has been going along around like this. This time it will be more severe, yes, but we, what we have to do, we'll um, talk about later on. In early 1900s, where tractors replaced farmers in agricultural uh, jobs. There was a big protest in many countries and uh, unemployment was because uh, industrial um, jobs required more skills and agricultural labor was not ready to go for those industrial jobs. But later on, uh, there was a high school movement uh, 
uh, governments trained their employees to adapt to the technological change and this is where the concept of human capital came into play. Uh, there was more emphasis on education, more emphasis on um, skill development and so on, which um, helped the labor to um, shift from agricultural jobs to industrial jobs. And this is what has been happening in the history. This is 1900s, uh, 120 years ago. So um, I think it will keep on happening. So most of the studies that try to explain wage inequality in the U.S., have attributed this increasing trend of wage inequality to the technological change, primarily the development of microcomputers. So in 1980s, when computer technology was introduced, this is where the wage inequality started to happen. This is why many studies um, uh, attribute the, the differences in the, in the wages, uh, wage inequality to technological change. Another observation is that many of the employees who are highly educated, meaning they have better human capital, they tend to use computer technology more often. And this kind of tells us that computer technology is complementary to hum human capital. Based on these facts, many studies have concluded that since the 1980s, the demand for cognitive tasks and jobs in uh, uh, sectors which demand more cognitive effort has increased. This is why there has been uh, increase in wage inequality and because technology replaces jobs, um, routinized jobs, jobs had in those sectors that are primarily dominant um, in routinized jobs, those sectors faced decline in labor demand and this is why wage inequality has increased. This hypothesis that a burst of new technology has caused the rise in demand for high skilled workers which in turn led to a rise in earnings inequality has become known as skill biased technical change hypothesis SBTC which we saw in very early slides of this lecture as well. This concern about technology taking away jobs is not new as I showed that in 1900s uh, technology was always there taking away jobs and many people were protesting on streets. In 1931, uh, in, uh, in one of the John Maynard Keynes books, uh, this excerpt is taken from there, uh, which states that um, technological unemployment will be the uh, agenda for, for many years to come. And uh, this has been the case. His, uh, his hypothesis was absolutely correct. In 1964, Isaac Asimov already predicted that by 2014, uh, routinized jobs will be mostly taken away by technology. And uh, schools will also transform into something that uh, uh, teachers will be using more and more, um, more, and more technology. And, and those who will survive this uh, new wave of technology will be the ones who are doing some kind of creative work. Many new robots have been installed um, or introduced in the manufacturing process every year, taking away more and more jobs every year. Um, automation is not only limited to manufacturing, it is also taking away many services jobs, for example, in call centers. Uh, technology can now answer routine customer service jobs. One of the videos of Sundar Peshai from Google is also on how you can uh, schedule an appointment with the barber using technology. So uh, technology does a brilliant job in um, answering complex questions and scheduling an appointment with the barber. Um, he demonstrated that very nicely in, the, in, in one of his YouTube videos. You should go and check it out. Um, then. Uh, Big data suggests what to buy, so you do not need, need uh, salespersons anymore. Uh, softwares are taking care of your accounting, translation and paralegal services. And then there are travel agents. Most of them have been replaced by technology because most of the uh, bookings, travel bookings are done um, online in the US. In public sector too, technology has been replacing many jobs. Uh, so in Pakistan, automation of systems in the central bank made 25% of the labor force redundant. Mostly they were low-skilled staff. 
um, savings boosted the salaries of remaining em employees, good for remaining employees, but those who lost their jobs, uh, we have to find solution for them in grand scheme of things. Two thirds of all jobs could be susceptible for, to automation in developing countries in coming decades, uh, because this is what we are seeing in, um, in we have seen already, by the way, in U US and Europe. And uh, this percentage is much higher in uh, US and Europe already because they have been seeing this for a long, long time. And technological change is adopted first in the developed world and then it comes to developing countries uh, in general. So in uh, US and Europe, 50 to 60 percent jobs will uh, are threatened by technology at least. So ICT automation is not only efficient, it's also cheap. So when prices fall and uh, efficiency rises, of course, um, labor demand will go down. So as I said, technology will take away some jobs, create some new, and we have to adapt. But adaptation takes time because you need to know, uh, you need to create institutions. If Even if you have institutions already, you have to um, train those employees, support them in this period, and then find jobs jobs for them in the in the new sectors so it takes time to adjust um, and all these um, factors require a lot of um, uh, policy making and a lot of preparation as well so we cannot just sit back and relax that technology will come and take care of itself countries are more concerned about those who are daily wagers uh, who are poor already already suffering in normal circumstances and when they lose jobs they do not have anything to fall back on so um, think about them so if technology takes away their jobs what will they do so as a policy maker uh, we have to think about them and find jobs for them and this is where the role of vocational training um, and uh, anything else that can help them adapt to the changing nature of work would would help you know this is where governments should invest